What's up, guys? My name is Josh. Welcome back to episode 7 of Fab 201. Glad to have you guys back in the classroom. Today we're going to be talking about how to play like a pro. Now, normally when we talk about playing like a pro, we're talking about strategy, tactics, decision making, etc. Sideboarding decisions. However, today we're going to be talking about all the other things that go into playing the game of flesh and blood at the highest level. Namely, we're going to be talking about how to communicate properly, uh, verbally and on the board, how to play cleanly, and how to finish your rounds quickly. So let's just jump right into that. So. Fab is a social game, and Fab is a physical game. What do I mean by that? Well, when we're talking about competitive flesh and blood, we are talking about pro quests, skirmishes, callings, pro tours, nationals. Those all happen in real life. Those all happen face-to-face, -face, you know, four or five feet away from your opponent in a giant convention center with hundreds of other like-minded people. So you're going to have to talk and communicate with people. And that is actually one of the appealing things for me about the game is that the game is played in the flesh and blood. Fab is a physical game in that you have your cards, you feel your cards, you have your dice, you have your equipment, there's, there's a lot of tactile things about the game pieces. I mean, we we all love our cardboard. We all love our shiny cardboard. We all love we all have our accessories, etc. Right. So, what is the goal of today? Is to have to help you have a fun and clean match. And how are we going to do that? I'm going to teach you some communication tricks. I'm going to teach you how to play cleanly. And I'm going to teach you how to play at a brisk pace. So we have 18 different tips today that I've collected from myself and from my teammates and from a few of my friends as well around the world. So let's just jump right into that. Tip number one. How to shuffle and how to randomize your deck so proper shuffling technique in this game is very important okay this is called the mash shuffle or the riffle shuffle okay you do that seven or eight times is sufficient randomization you want to do it ten times go ahead do it ten times just be quick about it Okay, when you are shuffling your deck, and especially when you're shuffling your opponent's deck, the card should be face the card face should be down and away from you. All right, down and away, and your eyes should be at your opponent or in the opposite direction. All right, this is the only proper way to shuffle cards at a competitive level all right after you are done shuffling place the cards on the play mat square them up and give them a cut or two and then present it to your opponent always cut the deck after shuffling that way your opponent can be confident that you did not mess with their deck and likewise, if your opponent does not cut your deck after shuffling, request that they do so. Just to protect yourself. All right. If they refuse to do so, call a judge. Okay. So tip number two. Announce life total changes. Now, from what I've seen so far, most people are pretty good about this. Um... However, 
with the upcoming Pro Tour, there will be people from around the world. There will be people... I mean, I live in the U.S., and the U.S. callings have basically been all native English speakers. That will not be the case at the Pro Tour. There will be people who are from around the world, and English will not be their first language. All right? So you need to be very clear with your life total changes. All right? And it's always a good idea to double check the life totals from time to time. Okay. Tip number three. Understand what you can and cannot shortcut in this game. The classic example that I like to give is that if you take tunic energy, that could be responded to. So if you are planning to, let's say I'm going to play via the Vanguard, I should not just play via the Vanguard taking the tunic at the same time. Especially against Prism because they can respond to it with Arc Light Sentinel, okay? You take the Tunic Energy first, ask if there's a response, no response, then you can play your card, all right? Similarly, if you're playing Chain, the final Soul Shackle can be responded to by Prism, and oftentimes that they will decide whether they want to respond or not based on what you banished. Another example that comes up from time to time is when you're using the uh, Enlightened Strike draw mode. If you're playing against Kano, this can be the opportunity when you have shields down, basically, and they could go for it. So, basically, if you're playing against Prism or Kano because they like to play at instant speed, you should not be shortcutting things, and you should always give your opponent ample time to... Uh, to cut in if they want to. All right. Tip number four. Uh, if you've played me in real life, you will know that I always have these kind of this magenta-ish deep purple dice with uh, some gold specks on them. And I use these for everything. Um, and especially I... As a warrior, the attack and defense values are very, very important because they often change because of attack reactions and defense reactions. So, in general, I like to use dice to represent the damage. Now, this helps me make sure that I didn't mess up any calculations on how much damage I'm dealing, and it helps my opponent not ask me three times how much damage is coming at them, right? I just say, look, I put the dice there for you so you can, uh, you can, you, you don't have to ask me about that, okay? This also helps your opponent play faster and it reduces any confusion or mis misinterpretation, all right? When your opponent blocks, if it's an important block, I also like to put dice on their block to confirm their block. And that just helps to, uh, this just makes things much, much more smooth. So using dice to represent the damage of an attack will also help you uh, on defense as well. Sometimes when my opponent is attacking me, sometimes I, if they don't put dice down, I will put dice down for them so I can visualize like, okay, this attack is for nine, okay? And then that just helps my thinking personally. Okay, tip number five, uh, print out cards for sideboarding. So what I like to do before a big tournament is I like to create these, you know, three and a half by two and a half uh, inch cards with all my sideboard info and print them out, cut them up, put them into sleeves and put them in my deck box. Um, I, I prefer this much more than uh, you know, a giant piece of paper or having the, um, having it as a page in my uh, life counter book. Make sure you include, uh, all your sideboard notes there, including whether you're going to be on the play or draw get, if you win the dice roll and any changes based on player draw as well. Finally, it's all, it's a good idea to put a, 
to put your name and contact on one of the uh, on one of the p pieces of paper and put it on a sleeve, put it in a sleeve and put it into your deck box because if your deck box ever walks off, there might be a chance that uh, it could be recovered. Right? Tip number six. This is very important for those of you who play a switch style deck or a multi style deck is to put your equipment in a single stack pregame. Now, this is very, very important for warrior in general. For example, Raiden versus Sabres. If you're putting things onto the mat, that gives information away that could alter their sideboarding decisions. Same with whether you're playing the uh, Manable Claws or the Romping Club with Brute. So this is just information that you don't need to give away. Put your, put your equipment in a single stack. Tip number seven. If you are double blocking or triple blocking or quadruple blocking, make sure that when you're blocking the name of the card and the defense value are visible at the same time. This bugs me to no end when people stack their cards in such a way that I cannot see both of the defense values or both of the names of the cards. Because this is very, very relevant information for calculating damage, obviously. And the name of the cards are also, also give me a lot of information about what they intend to do on their turn, right? So I'm very curious to, to, to see what they block with, right? So this will save a couple seconds of time for me having to split the cards apart, all right? So please, when you're blocking, please block like that first picture, please. Tip number eight, determining the player draw. At high level events, I have started to go with odd or even. I present a single dice to my opponent, ask them odd or even, and let them roll. Not only does this save time, because if you are using high roll and you tie, you have to roll again. Um, when you're rolling two dice, they might knock into each other, and then they fly off, and then that's another 30 seconds of, you know, trying to go get the dice. So, in general, from now on, I just think odd even is the way to go. However, at the more casual level events, you can high roll, that's fine. But if you do high roll, you should use the same dice as your opponent. If you roll first, present the dice to your opponent to roll. If your opponent rolls first, use the same dice that they just rolled. All right. Tip number nine. Whenever you draw a card, you need to resolve it slowly. Now, the, the reason is that when you're drawing a card or tutoring a card, this is where you are most likely to get a penalty at a competitive level event because you've looked at a card that you're not supposed to look at or you're taking an action that you're not supposed to be taking an action for. Currently in the game, there's no, um, there's no cards that say you can't draw cards, but... Those could come down the line, and this is just something you need to be aware of. As like a little um, fun side story, the only uh, uh, warning I ever got at a tournament in my life was at a MTG tournament in uh, Taiwan. And my opponent had a Narset part of Veils on the field, and I went to draw, and then I... I think I had like a Teferi and I was like, I'm going to draw a card with my Teferi. And I drew it too quickly and my opponent was like, hey, hey, you can't draw. Yeah, I have a Narset on board. And yeah, I, I got a penalty for that. So yeah, so it's 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 good to uh, resolve card draw slow, slowly in this game. Okay. Another example of, of this is when my, at the... Uh, in um, in Indianapolis, my opponent uh, revealed uh, he was using the belittle minimalism thing, 
and he revealed a card with too high power. And but he already went to go search his deck for for a card. And then I was like, you, "Can you reveal that to me? That's four power." And then we had to then we had to get the judge, and that took you know 15, 20 minutes. So whenever you're tutoring or drawing a card, resolve it. Take 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 an extra step to to think about it. Okay. Tip number ten. This has to deal with uh, this has to do with the prisms in particular. Um, prism spectral shields need to be represented individually. This means you, as a prism player, you need to have a stack of eight, ten, twelve spectral shields in your deck box. You cannot use a single spectral shield token and a dice on top of it to represent your spectral shields. Why? Because they can attack individually and they can gain counters individually. All right. So please do not use dice to represent your shields. Uh, those, this is fine for things like copper tokens because they don't attack. But it is not okay for the spectral shields. Okay. Tip number 11. This has to deal with how to manage the round timer effectively. So professional games are timed. You have 50 or 55 minutes to complete your match. And if your opponent is playing a little bit slowly, it is a good idea to remind them, hey, we only have 30 minutes left. Let's try to finish the match on time, yeah? And if you're really getting down on time, you can tell your opponent that I'm going to... We, we have like 10 minutes left. I'm going to play faster. It would be very helpful if you would also play faster. All right? Because in this game, draws are losses. And, you know, draws are, are not good for anybody, right? And I think a lot of players, they... I'm... 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 I fall victim to this many times as well, is that I will be looking at my hand and I see multiple lines of play that are good or multiple lines of play that are uh, equal, okay? And this is a quote from uh, a very famous uh, MTG player, uh, Paulo Vitor Damodarosa, and he said, the enemy of a good plan is the dream of a perfect plan. If you have gotten to the point where you are deciding between two good options, that's that's amazing. That's really good. Um, and the percentage points that you get between option A and option B is negligible in the long run. The main thing is getting to the point where you are you have eliminated the bad options. And now you're deciding between two good options. If you're deciding between two good options, just go with it. You'll, if you've played with me, some you'll sometimes I just say my gut says I'm going to do this. I'm just going to do it, right? So that will help you play quicker and uh, not go to time. Tip number twelve: Arsenal and hand differentiation. Uh, all I have to say about this is keep them separate. Oftentimes I will use different orientations for my arsenal and for my hand. I'll keep my arsenal vertical and I'll keep my hand kind of at an angle or at a, a horizontally just to make sure that there's no way to get them mixed up. And yeah. Tip number 13, sleeves. Use new sleeves for big events if possible. Why? Because it is very easy for them to get dirty or marked or dented or chipped or whatever um, over the course of time. After you have sleeved your deck up, make sure you spend a little bit of time shuffling it so it's not so not too new. In round one, we've all seen people where their deck is, you know, falling over because the sleeves are literally 
pack fresh, right? So take a little bit of time, shuffle them the night before, and you'll be good to go. Tip number 14, bring two colors of dice. Now, I talked about earlier how I like to use dice to represent a lot of different things. Sometimes you need to represent two of those different things. A classic example of this is when I'm using the Sabres Bolting Combo. I will use a I will use my maroon dice to represent the damage of the attack. Let's say five or seven. And then I have my orange dice here that help represent the number of attacks that that weapon has swung. So that's helpful. Another another case is like I use the orange for my dawn blade counters, and I use the uh, red red dice for the damage of the attack. All right. Um, every hero will be a little bit different, but it never hurts to have two colors of dice. Tip number 15, activating triggering hero abilities. This is something that comes up a lot of the time. Is Especially with Chain, I'm going to use Chain as a main example here, is when they have a very complicated turn, sometimes I forget or they forget if they've shackled. And then we have to kind of work back a little bit. Generally, we could figure it out if they have, right? But that's just time wasted. If you're going to activate your hero ability, tap it or move it to the combat chain, that will help a lot for remembering whether or not you have done something or whether or not you can do it. All right. Tip number 16, this has to deal with foils. Foils in this game are... Much better than in other games, but they are still subject to curl from time to time. And if you aren't double sleeving with like perfect cards, uh, foils can curl quite easily and they can become marked cards. And let's say you have your... Uh, your defense reactions foiled out for some reason and they curl. I mean, a judge is going to look at that kind of suspiciously, right? So in general, I would try to foil the whole deck out or I would use a vanilla deck if possible. Um, but if you do use like a mixture of them, just make sure that there's not a distinguishable pattern, right? I get in towards the end here. Tip number 17, touching cards. In general, especially with, you know, the whole COVID situation, uh, you should always ask your opponent before you touch their cards. Um, if you want to look at their graveyard, just ask them. They're obviously not going to say no. It's just a courtesy, right? Um and uh, if you are looking at their graveyard, do not change the order of the cards. Do not group the cards based on like, okay, let me pull all the defense reactions to the front. You cannot change the order of the graveyard. All right. <clears throat> that is not just me saying that. That is actually a rule. Okay. Um, the final tip I have for you guys today is to verbalize the game phases. This will help you especially at the beginning and end phases so if you say start of turn just verbalizing start of turn makes your mind think about okay it's the start of turn what do i do on my start of turn well i tick my tunic up that's what i do all right so don't just jump straight to the action phase verbalize the uh the stages of the game there's not that many of them there's only like three right so <laughs> so just just do that same with uh go to end phase uh don't just directly arsenal just sometimes it doesn't matter because your opponent has no response to what you're doing but for some classes it does matter so in general i just get into the habit of saying go to end phase if your opponent says sure 
then you take care of all the end step things that you need to do. Remember that there's no priority pass during the end phase. So once you both pass on an empty combat chain, or uh, uh, once you both pass priority on a on an empty combat chain with no layers, then you go directly to end phase. Okay. So I hope that you guys have. Uh, learn something. Maybe you knew about most of these, but hopefully there were a couple tips in there that you did not know about or just needed a refresher about. So communicating properly and playing cleanly and briskly will help you and your opponents have a better time during the tournament. And a tournament can be a very, very stressful thing. It could be, even though we're all having a lot of fun, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot at stake and, you know, it's a competitive environment. So, Doing those tips and just, you know, in general, being courteous and friendly with people and being clear with your uh, actions and all your uh, verbal communication and your board representation goes a long way. All right. If you guys have any other tips or tricks, leave them in the comments below. I'm sure I could learn a thing or two as well. So, yeah. I hope that you guys uh, have enjoyed this episode. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. See ya.